So in this presentation, I'd like to talk about the contents of this paper, which is in collaboration with Mayuko Yamashita. So the reason why I'm making this presentation is that the paper is written mainly as a math paper, and it will be a bit difficult for string theorists to understand, I think. But it also has lots of contents of interest to string theorists, I believe. And it touches upon the following topics. So it concerns non-supersymmetric heteroitic brains, uh, which I recently wrote about. And uh, it also touches upon classification of 2D spin holomorphic CFDs, about which I also wrote with a, friends of, a set of friends of mine. And it also discusses a uh, discrete part of the Green-Schwarz coupling, Stolz-Teichner conjecture, and so on and so on. So I can start this presentation by talking about either any one of them, but uh, I decided to talk, the start of the talk from the stoltz teichner conjecture. So this conjecture says that uh, a certain mathematical object, topological modular form, uh, which is an abelian group uh, subscripted by an integer D, is in fact classifies uh, two-dimensional n equals zero comma one supersymmetric theory uh, with a gravitational anomaly D, uh, which is twice the difference between right moving central charge and left moving central charge, uh, if they are conformal, uh, up to continuous deformation preserving this amount of supersymmetry. So it has a long history, but it hasn't been taken up by physicists until very recently, but uh, uh, in the last couple of years, there has been uh, interesting activities among, uh, on this conjecture. So the basic question ab about this stoltz teichner conjecture from a physics point of view is how to detect such uh, deformation classes, equivalence classes under this uh, such a deformation in this space. So how do we detect those deformation classes? So the general answer for such a question is as always to find functions uh, in this case, a function which assigns a number for a given super, super symmetric quantum field theory, which are invariant under deformations. So that's the idea. A classic example of such an invariant is the elliptic genus of Witten, introduced in 1989. Ah, so if you download the PDF file of this presentation, you can always click these purple colored letters, which brings you to the paper. So elliptic genus is the generating function of the written index of the system on S1, uh, which is in the R sector, a spin structure, uh, for each value of L0. So in an uh, equation, the elliptic genus is a trace over the Hilbert space on the system of S1 with R sector, and uh, weighted with the uh, fermion parity. And then you have this standard uh, combination. And because of this uh, right moving fermion number, the right movers are projected out to right moving vacuum, and you basically have the Witten index uh, for the left movers. Uh, it turns out that this quantity is non-zero only when this combination D, gravitational anomaly, or the twice of the central charge difference is zero modulo four. It is because of the certain uh, gravitational anomaly. Another example is the modulo two elliptic genus, which is recently discussed in my paper with the Yamashita no Yonekura. So that's the generating function of the mod two Witten index of the system on uh, the same uh, R sector S1 uh, for each value of L0. So you, if you know Witten index, you probably knows that there's a mod, mod two in version of the written index, right? So there are mod two index theorem, etc. And you know that elliptic genus is a quantum field theory version of the written index. So it is a natural thing to combine this mod two nest uh, in and the uh, elliptic genus, but somehow nobody has done that in the last 20 or 30 years. And, uh, but you can do that. So the expression is basically, instead of uh, having a fermion parity, you just count the number uh, of states uh, modulo two. So that's what I wanted to uh, signify by this quote unquote around trace. So you take the, this, you do this computation 
modulo two, and you get some something. So that's the modulo two elliptic genus, and that's also an invariant of quantum field theories, super sorry, supersymmetric quantum field theories of this class, and it is known there only when this central charge difference d uh, is one or two modulo eight. So that again comes from the property of uh, mod two uh, Wheaton index. So the next question is, uh, do ordinary and mod two elliptic genus characterize deformation classes? The answer is no, if you believe the stoltz teichner conjecture. For example, Bunke and Naumann uh, introduced in 2009 a certain invariant uh, in the math context, uh, which is later uh, reanalyzed from physics point of view by Gaiotto, Johnson, Freight, and Witten, and Yonekura. And that's a very subtle invariant, uh, which is a bit hard to explain, so I don't go into details. But it assigns, for example, to the n equals 0, 1 sigma model on S3 with H flux given by K, or in other words, if you consider <clears throat> N equals 0, 1 version of versus the Mino Witten model on SU2 group manifold, so that the level is K, then the value of this invariant is K modulo 24. And uh, so, so that's one example of non zero invariant of this type. And the analysis of Bunke and Naumann show that. This invariant can only be non-zero when the central charge difference D is three modulo 24. So it's a strange condition, but it arises after a detailed computation by them. So that's another invariant. So you, we can now ask a refined question. That's the combination of ordinary elliptic genus, mod two elliptic genus, and bunke naumann invariant. Do they completely detect deformation classes the answer is still no, assuming stoltz teichner conjecture. So to specify um, this question more carefully in mathematics, let AD to be the subgroup of TMFD uh, whose ordinary or mod to elliptic genus is zero. So TMFD, uh, if we believe stoltz teichner conjecture, classifies the deformation classes of two-dimensional 0, 1 supersymmetric quantum field theory uh, where the central charge difference is given by D, right? So that's TMFD. And uh, we are interested in the most subtle part of the TMFD where the ordinary elliptic genus and the model two elliptic genus both vanish. So that's a rather subtle uh, type of SQFD and uh, they form an abelian group AD. So you can look up this group AD in the book about TMF. And uh, well, it, it, it has lots of entries, but uh, in the range of immediate interest to heterotic string theory, uh, which turns out to be minus 31, <laughs> between minus 31 and nine, the non-zero AD are these entries. So A3 is Z24, A6 is Z2, et cetera, et cetera. So this A3, is detected by Bunke and Naumann invariant. Uh, but what are the others? Well, so explaining the classes in A3, A6, A8, A9 are quite uh, easy because A positive uh, comes from uh, N equals 0, 1 sigma models. So a3, as I already said, I mean, the generator of A3 is just uh, this is a mino model on S3, which is supersymmetrized to have n equals 0, 1 supersymmetry. And uh, K uh, mod 24 just measures the level of the versus a mino model. And the same is true for A6, A8, and A9. So mathematicians have found that if you instead of SU2 versus the Minovita model, but SU2 times SU2 versus the Minovita model, or SU3 or SU2 to the cube, then it has dimension four and this has dimension eight and this has dimension nine. So they are in A6, A8 and A9. So they are the generators. And uh, well, you can easily compute by 
uh, semi-classical uh, analysis that uh, these sigma models or heterotic versus the minority models have zero elliptic genus and zero model two elliptic genus. So they are definitely in the subgroup, in this particular subgroup of TMFT. But the negative ones are more complicated. Ah, so th these are the positive ones. But what are these uh, negative entries, A minus 28, A minus 30, and A minus 31? So that's the question. In addition, mathematicians say that there is actually a Pontryagin duality between AD and A minus 22 minus D if uh, D is not equal to three module 24. So there's no uh, Pontryagin dual pair for this A3, which is detected by bunke naman invariant, but for the others, A6 is paired with A minus 28, a8 is paired with a minus 30, and a9 is paired with a minus 31. So what is this pairing, physically speaking? So far, I only talked about stoltz teichner conjecture, but here, suddenly, the classification of spin holomorphic uh, two-dimensional CFT is coming. So note that stoltz teichner conjecture concerns n equals 0, 0,1 uh, super symmetric quantum field theories, and this parameter d is twice the difference of the central charge. But uh, well, we can consider purely left-moving uh, non-supersymmetric modular invariant spin CFTs, uh, by which I mean the case when CL is positive, but CR is zero. And uh, being n equals zero comma one supersymmetric requires supersymmetry only for the right movers, but for such purely left-moving theories, uh, the right movers are empty. Therefore, any non-supersymmetric uh, uh, purely left-moving theories are actually automatically n equals zero comma one supersymmetric because the supersymmetric size is just empty. So whenever you have such non-supersymmetric modular invariant spin uh, holomorphic CFTs, it is actually an n equals zero comma one SQFT. And then the uh, TMF parameter D is in fact twice and minus twice the left moving central charge. But such uh, purely left moving non supersymmetric spin modular invariant CFTs are recently classified uh, by my friends and me, and also by uh, physicists, and also by two mathematicians. So our paper only covers the case below and equal to central charge 16. And the other two groups uh, did the classification up to 24. So <laughs> uh, our result is much smaller than the rest. But anyway, uh, so the result of the classification is this uh, up to central 16. So at C equals 16, there are two familiar cases of modular invariant CFTs, EA times E8 and SO32. But here we only assuming the modular invariance on, on uh, torus with a given spin structure. So then there's in fact another case, S of 16 times S of 16. And in the central charge uh, 31 over two, there are E8 level two. Ah, so I forgot to say that in these three cases, everything is level one. And at central charge 15, there, are, there is one spin modular invariant CFTs based on SU16, uh, affine algebra at level one, and that's level, sorry, central charge 14. There is a CFT based on E7 times E7. And then central charge 12, there's SO24 uh, CFT, and so on, so on. So there are not that, that many below central charge e equals 16. But it turns out that these three red ones have zero ordinary and or mod two elliptic genus, uh, which is easy to check. And it is tantalizing, I say, that these three uh, numbers, which is minus two CL, appear exactly when this uh, A minus D are non-trivial. So this A minus D is what uh, 
the theory of topological modular forms and the Stolz Teichina conjecture uh, predicts about the interesting uh, super conformal or super symmetric quantum field theories, which has which which are non-trivial but has zero ordinary or model to genus. So it is very likely, I think, that we, we think that these three cases are actually uh, SQFT representative in the sense of stolz teichner conjecture of these uh, elements. Furthermore, um, these spin CFTs provide the angular part of the non-supersymmetric hegetic brains uh, my friends and I recently described in a short letter. So these are four brains or six brains and seven brains. So in the near extremal limit, uh, it has the following form. So there's this world volume of the brain and the radial direction and also the angular direction, right? And it has some gauge field on it. And of course you have current algebra degrees of freedom, but that you can analyze the outcome of this angular part together with the current algebra degrees of freedom. And you can show that under the renormalization group flow, it flows to, uh, uh, in the case of seven brain, it flows to E8 level two. And in the case of six brain, you get SU16. And in the case of four brain, you get E7 times E7 uh, spin CFTs. So, they, as I said, would correspond to a minus 31 or a minus 30 or a minus 20. And uh, the funny thing is that if you consider these three cases of heterotic compactifications on these angular spaces, the remaining space time has dimension nine or eight or six. And uh, if you perform the quantization of the world sheet degrees of freedom on that side, uh, you would naturally get objects in A9 or A8 or A6. And then you, you seem to have a nice pairing between A9 and A minus 31, A8 and A minus 30, or A6 and A minus 28. So this pairing is exactly what mathematicians had said about the pairing between AD and A minus D minus 22. So this minus 22 also arises from heteristic string theory. Uh, concretely take the pair uh, of uh, d equal six and e seven times e seven, which is in a minus twenty eight. So what would this uh, a six, uh, which is a z two subgroup, but well, this is generated by s u two times s u two group manifold, which is six dimensional uh, with h flux on both sides, provide for heteric string compactification with a seven times e seven theory as the internal degrees of freedom. So that's the question. The answer is that SU2 uh, group manifold is trivial in spin boldism, but it is not trivial if you put the H flux in string boldism. Uh, this is a boldism theory where you demand the existence of the three form of field H, which satisfies dH equaling uh, minus, sorry, one over two times the Pontryagin class. Uh, this is one of the uh, results of the equations of motion of heteritic strings. And uh, that's what this is the Boltzmann group appropriate for heteritic string theory. And so that's the case for the dimension three, but in dimension six, if you take the product of the two such S3 with uh, H flux on both sides, then this is a Z2 torsion string Boltzmann class. So if, if you have such a, a discrete Boltzmann class, uh, from the low energy point of view, you can add the add the discrete gravitational theta angle, or more precisely, it's a gravitational slash H field theta angle uh, to the effective action, uh, which assigns minus one to the phase of the partition function whenever the space time contains this uh, subtle uh, string Boltzmann class. So the question now is the following. Once the internal CFT for the heterotic compactification is fixed, such discrete gravitational slash H field theta angle should be computable, right? And so what kind of computation should we do? So for a D-dimensional uh, heterotic compactification, uh, and if you are interested in computing gravitational slash H field 
uh, discrete theta angle, the internal CFT should have the following central charge. So the heterotic string is a mixture of the bosonic string on the left hand side and the super string on the right hand side. So the, if you have a d-dimensional compactification, the internal part should have CL, which is 26 minus T, and uh, CR, which is R, ah, 3 over 2 times 10 minus T, right? So it, it's corresponding uh, TMF class arising from the two-dimensional SQFT associated to this uh, space-time part should have the degree twice CR minus CL, which turns out to be minus 22 minus D, right? So this realizes exactly the pairing between D and the minus 22 minus D. So this pairing is predicted by algebraic topologists, but now we realize that it also comes from heteristic string theory. So the natural guess is that this Pontryagin or Anderson dual pairing between AD and A minus 22 minus D mathematicians had constructed is actually the gravitational slash H field theta angle, which is part of the green schwartz coupling. So to show this with Yamashita and with a lot of help from Yonekura, we developed the theory of discrete global part of Green-Schwartz anomaly cancellation and Green-Schwartz coupling using stable homotopy theory. Very schematically, uh, what we did is the following. Uh, so the perturbative Green-Schwartz cancellation and coupling goes as follows. You first compute the anomaly polynomial of fermions. We, let me, me call it as PD plus two, and it has a factor so it has a factorization, and it has a factor one over two times a gravitational Pontryagin class minus uh, the instant on number density, right? Therefore, this anomaly polynomial can be divided by this combination. So it has this form, and you take the other factor, and the green schwartz coupling is given by B wedge this x d minus two. So that's the part of a different case. We want to do the same, but with the global anomaly part. So what we need to do is the following. So you first need to show that the global version of this anomaly polynomial, or more precisely, well, it's just the anomaly invertible theory. So it has, in some sense, a factor of so this one over two P1R minus instant number density, right? So this is exactly what we already did in our previous paper with Yamashita. So, but then, you, you need to show that this global version of the anomaly thing can be divided in an appropriate sense by this combination, right? So you need to do that. And then you need to show that it can be given as an interpretation of the global version of B wedge X D minus two. And furthermore, you need to show that it equals the Anderson duality of TMF. So that's exactly what we did. Uh, interesting for me, this step that the to step of showing that the global version of this anomaly polynomial uh, can be divided by this combination in an appropriate sense was actually pointed out by Professor Kawazumi, a mathematician, while my collaborator Yamashita was giving a seminar on our previous paper to mathematicians. So, so Professor Kawazumi asks the following question. So in her presentation, uh, the, it was shown that the anomaly vanishes, right? So it was phrased in mathematical language in a way that a certain invariant vanished. So let, we can call it the primary invariant. So the mathematical content of our previous paper was a certain primary invariant vanishes. But then mathematically, using st stable homotopy theory, you can easily define a st secondary invariant which is non-zero. So it's like taking a derivative of function when the function itself is zero, right? Then taking the derivative, you can extract something non-zero and you can do that in homotopy theory too. So there should be a non-zero, uh, there is a non-zero secondary invariant. And he asked, what is the physics interpretation? So Mayuko wrote an email to me saying that uh, one of the audience members asked such and such question, and I started thinking about it. And that was when I was working with other friends of mine uh, on 
heterotic non-supersymmetric strings, sorry, non-supersymmetric brains. And uh, after a while, uh, I realized that, yes, the secondary uh, invariant might be actually the Green-Schwartz coupling of these non-supersymmetric heterotic brains. And the rest is history. So that's the end of the presentation. And if you're interested, please have a look at our paper. And it, ha it is written for mathematicians mainly, but it has a section, single section, section two, which is a summary and translation of the contents uh, of the paper into physics or string theory language. So if you're interested, please have a look. Thank you very much.